Hi, I'm Joel Willits, and uh, it's my pleasure to spend a little bit of time with you discussing uh, these four topics that you've asked me to address. Uh, the New Testament, um, under uh, represented voices, teaching modalities, and key influences. When it comes to thinking about that potential criticism uh, that the study of the New Testament is a an ivory tower, uh, abstract academic field that has little to do with everyday life. Um, my immediate response is yes. Uh, there are lots of people who teach the New Testament and write about the New Testament that you come away from thinking, I'm, I have no idea what this has to do with, with the real world. So um, I think that criticism does uh, match some of what's done under the heading of New Testament scholarship and New Testament teaching. But I actually don't think that a genuine understanding of the nature of New Testament studies and the task of teaching the New Testament, uh, a genuine understanding of that uh, does not lead to, uh, to a concept of New Testament scholarship as ivory tower or abstract. Um, I think the best uh, description of the nature of New Testament studies and thereby the, therefore the task of teaching the New Testament was said by the imminent um, Cambridge professor of the 20th century, C.H. Dodd. Um, in 1936, Dodd moves from uh, Oxford to Cambridge and takes up the Norris Hulse uh, professor professorship uh, in the Faculty of Divinity at, uh, at uh, Cambridge University. And in his inaugural lecture, he deals with the topic, the present task of New Testament studies, the present task of New Testament studies. And here's the printed uh, version of, of the lecture. Um, it's one of my valued possessions. Um, and at the very end of the lecture, Dodd, um, in a short paragraph, describes the ideal interpreter of the New Testament. And in his description, he captures, I think, essentially uh, the nature of New Testament studies. This is what he says, and I've, I have it here so you can read along with me. Um, the ideal interpreter, I'm at the bottom of page 40, uh, would be one who has entered into that strange first century world, has felt its whole strangeness, has sojourned in it until he has lived himself into it, thinking and feeling as one of those to whom the gospel first came, and who will then return into our world and give to the truth he has discerned a body out of the stuff of his own thought or our own thought. He concludes, this is an ideal that any of us or all of us together will be able to realize it fully or to give a final interpretation of the New Testament, final even for our own age, is not to be supposed. But here our task lies. So here our task lies as, an, as New Testament uh, scholars as, as those who work in the field of New Testament studies, our task is to become ideal interpreters. Uh, and, and that is a process of going from here to there and then back again, from here to there and back again. Essentially, God is arguing that the nature of New Testament studies is a project of imagination through the study of history and culture and archaeology and languages, just to name a few, we gain an informed imagination so that we can uh, go back into that, into that time and place and stand shoulder to shoulder with those who first heard the gospel, thinking, as Dodd says, and feeling what they thought and felt. We want to live back into that period of time to the degree that we become a part of that story. But then we don't stay there. We come back into our world and we give in our time and our place a rendering of that uh, in its most authentic, historically, theologically grounded ways. It's a concrete work. It's, it's every day-ish. Um, and it is, uh, it's, it's what New Testament studies is all about. When it comes to teaching the New Testament, um, I think our goal is to, uh, to equip 
uh, men and women who are preparing for lives of ministry to do that same thing uh, in, in some degree, at least, where they have the resources available to them. They have learned about the history of the time, and the, they've, they've been in touch with some of the archaeology of the time, um, and they, they have learned the, the languages of the New Testament um, so that they can put themselves in that first century world and live into it uh, to the degree that they become a participant. And then they come back into their world and they preach and teach now, not just as a, a series of ideas, but because they've participated in it, it's become part of them. They embody it in their preaching and teaching and in their discipleship and in the leadership roles that they fulfill. Um, the teaching the New Testament is a equipping project so that students who are going to be leaders of the church in the middle of the 20th century have a deep resource for engaging uh, the important, most important things um, of the Christian faith in the pages of the New Testament. So that's what I think uh, is the nature of New Testament studies and the task of teaching the New Testament. It's about this going from here to there and back again, uh, as Dodd described the ideal interpreter. Now, as far as underrepresented voices go, um, I believe that uh, my years, my nearly two decades at North Park, have made me attuned well to the voices of the underrepresented, the, the, the marginal perspectives. Um, North Park, as an institution, is located in the city of Chicago. It's one of the few evangelical universities that are within the city limits, any city limits. Um, the neighborhood that we, uh, that we exist in is one of the most diverse zip codes in the nation. Uh, the high school that is adjacent to North Park boasts of 40 different language groups represented in it. Um, there is a diversity that's, that's rich um, when, when you're a professor at North Park, the, the staff and the faculty and the students. Um, I have been invited in this diverse context. I've been invited to, to reckon with my white male privilege. Uh, I've, I've been invited to name uh, the white supremacy that is part and parcel with my cultural heritage, both um, uh, uh, non-religiously and religiously, um, I have made it an aim to uh, decenter uh, myself uh, and decenter male whiteness, so that people of color and women uh, have a place uh, where their voices can be heard and they can be seen. Um, this has become a, a, a great passion of mine. Um, I have lots of, of ways to go. Um, I believe I'll be uh, wrestling with this um, white maleness uh, for the rest of my life, but I'm sensitive to it. And, um, and I intend whenever possible to promote and to support underrepresented voices, both in scholarship, in the, in the field, but also in the classroom. So the way I do this in the classroom is when I'm choosing textbooks, I make sure that if possible, I choose a textbook written by a person of color and a female. So in my Jesus class, I have students read James Cone's book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Um, and in my Paul class, I have students read Lisa Bowens' recent book called African American Readings of Paul. Um, these kinds of resources uh, promote underrepresented voices in the classroom. And so when I'm preparing a class, uh, a course, I'm looking for these underrepresented voices to bring uh, as a part of the conversation. Um, so uh, I'm really thankful that that's something that's important to you at Denver Seminary. And if I were to be uh, appointed as a professor at Denver, you can count on me to be a strong advocate for underrepresented, uh, marginalized voices and perspectives 
uh, on the campus and within the field of New Testament studies. Now, with regard to teaching modalities, let me say that I have taught online courses. Uh, I have taught five online courses, all of which I designed. I am currently teaching three um, hybrid courses. So I've created three hybrid courses. And, um, and of course, of course, I teach traditional classes. Um, I now am fully immersed in all three of these modalities. And while uh, uh, initially leery about what can really be accomplished um, in theological education through the, uh, the, the uh, online learning experience, uh, having now done it for several years, um, I do see its great advantages. Um, it does have advantages and the technology is getting better and better, say with Zoom, for example, that you can make a classroom much more first person, um, both asynchronous and synchronous, of course, um, but uh, with, a, with a tool like Zoom that you couldn't do even a few years ago. Um, and so I think technology is gonna be improving um, as we go forward here in the next uh, you know, few years and online education is just going to become easier, and it's an innovative tool that we, we must do for the sake of the church. Um, and so I'm, I'm fully on board. I will just say that I do hold uh, the highest esteem for the traditional classroom, because I think uh, the ultimate kind of theological education is a Finkenwalde kind of education, the, 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 the seminary in Finkenwalde that uh, Bonhoeffer created, uh, this, this life on life uh, discipleship, theological training um, in community uh, is the ideal, but, um, but that's not the world we live in, uh, at least not for everyone. And so we need to be able to help uh, people who are called to ministry to be equipped for ministry wherever they find themselves. Um, so I'm all for that. Lastly, then, the influences. I've already mentioned North Park. I cannot say enough about how great an influence North Park has been on me, not only because of its diversity and its commitment to inclusion, but also because it was where I grew up as a professor and as a scholar. Um, I've been there for nearly two decades. It was my first job out of my PhD. It's in my DNA. That's, that institution will forever uh, mark the way I teach and the way I approach uh, Christian education. Um, secondly, Cambridge and my time in England, um, uh, doing an MPhil and a PhD, uh, greatly, significantly influential, uh, much more than I can say here, but simply to say my time in Cambridge under uh, my supervisor, people like Marcus Bachmuel, and like Hermann Lichtenberger in Tübingen, I had a chance to spend a semester in Tübingen while I was there, um, may have made me a good thinker, um, a good scholar. Uh, to whatever degree I've been able to contribute to the study of the New Testament, it has everything to do with the training I received uh, under men like Marcus and, and, uh, and Professor Lichtenberger. Um, it also put me in touch with British New Testament scholarship and scholarship in New Testament on the continent of Europe. And uh, for that legacy, for those legacies, I'm greatly thankful. Um, finally, last but not least, my wife of 28 years has been the greatest influence on my life um, since I was a baby. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I would say in this context, the most important thing to say about her influence on me is she keeps me grounded um, I'm a seven on the Enneagram. We like Enneagram in our family, and uh, Carla's an eight. So I'm up in my in my head, and she's in her body. And I can have a tendency to run a million miles an hour with my hair on fire, uh, seeking after every next adventure. Um, and she's kind of keeping me grounded uh, and and present in in my relationships. And uh, and she has therefore made me a better human being. And, uh, and has made me then a better pastor and a better professor. So um, I'm thankful for her tethering. Um, I will not become an ivory tower uh, uh, scholar or an abstract thinker. Uh, my wife won't let me. Well, thanks for the time. And I look forward to hearing from you soon.